Hey everybody, we're going to pick up with integumentary system accessory structures. Now, if you're following me in the course pack, this information begins on page 57. There are three accessory structures to skin that we're going to talk about in this PowerPoint, hair, nails, and glands. Let's start off with hair. You'll notice that hairs here are located on all parts of the body except for the palms of the hands, soles of the feet, lips, and external genitalia, including the nipples. Okay, so structurally, hairs emerge from a follicle, which is embedded deep within the skin. You're looking at a picture of a hair inside its follicle, and let's zoom in on this picture down here on the bottom. So the follicle down here is actually made up of stratum basal. So I'm just going to put a note here so we remember that the follicle is actually stratum basal. So is stratum basal part of the epidermis or the dermis? Stratum basal is actually part of the epidermis. Okay, it's the bottommost layer of that epidermis. So the stratum basal is the follicle and it gives rise to the hair root. The hair root is this portion here within that hair follicle. Okay, so on your worksheet, you'll notice that the follicle provides growth for new cells for the hair root. If the follicle is damaged, which would be stratum basal, what happens to hair growth? Well, hair growth would stop. So if you want to completely stop further hair growth, it is the follicle that has to no longer provide growth. You can pluck hairs out by their roots and they'll grow back. We know that, right? But it is the stratum basal which forms that follicle that is what has to be damaged, and that can be done through something like electrolysis or even repeated plucking of hairs can also cause damage so that the hair may not grow back. All right, so the portion of the hair that sits inside here we know is called the hair root. This portion down here they've already labeled for us as the hair bulb, this fattened region or end of the hair. And of course, the hair is going to continue to grow as long as the follicle is present. However, if the root is damaged, you know, no big deal. You can just simply have another root grow back as long as that follicle is intact and able to produce new cells. So the hair may in fact fall out if the root has been damaged, but the hair can grow back. The portion that you can see sticking up above the head or the arm or wherever hair is growing, this portion here is called the hair shaft. All right, now, so that hair is of course made up of dead keratinized cells. There is some um, collagen in here. And now, because they are dead, if you go to the barber shop and you say, hey, cut off all my dead ends, instead of saying cut off my split ends, they have a right to shave you bald because all of your hair is composed of dead keratinized cells. So on your worksheet, be sure and fill in that hair is made of keratin and the pigmentation here is due to melanin. Okay, so let's take a look here. I'm going to circle stratum basal. Okay, stratum basal, of course, is the hair follicle, and the hair follicle is what gives rise to the hair root. This bulb shape ending down here, this is the hair root. So like we talked, if you damage the hair follicle, the hair root can no longer grow. However, if the hair root is damaged, your hairs can regrow back as long as that follicle is still intact. All right, so in this image, you can see the purple area, which is stratum basal. It travels all the way down around the bottom of the hair. And so, of course, that is the hair follicle down here closest to the hair root. I also would like to point out to you in this picture, a muscle, this one here, it's called the erector pili muscle. And what is the function of the erector pili muscle? It, hairs, it stands hairs on end when you're either cold or when you're scared. Now, the whole point of having your hair stand on end is to trap the heat closer to the surface of the body. So heat is trapped in between these hairs. It insulates around your skin. We don't necessarily see our hairs puff up like a cat would when a cat has been scared. But that is the point, is to make ourselves look bigger, like a cat makes itself look bigger when its hairs stand on end. One last comment about this particular muscle, it is an involuntary muscle. 
And of course, the name erector means that it is standing hair straight. Pili means hair. So literally translated, this particular muscle stands hair straight on end. Next, you'll notice there's two types of hairs. We've got vellus hairs and terminal hairs. Vellus hairs are common all over your body. We sometimes think of them as peach fuzz hairs. They don't grow very long and they don't have a lot of pigmentation in them. By contrast, terminal hairs are the ones found on your head, armpit, and in the groin area. Terminal hairs have more pigmentation. They're heavier. Um, they're more substantial hairs. They may in fact be curly. So terminal hairs are the ones that give us, say, our hair color, for instance, while vellus hairs are gonna be found on the inside of your arm. They're hardly noticeable. They're very tiny, fine hairs. So I thought you might be interested in seeing straight hairs versus curly hairs. The shape of your hair actually depends on the shape of your hair follicle. Your hair follicle is genetically driven in its shape and it can change over your lifetime. Likewise, gray hairs are shown here. They're actually structurally different from a pigmented hair like the two shown below. Gray hairs have pockets of air in them which makes them even more difficult to tame and to color. Let's talk about nails for just a moment. We know that nails are found on the terminal ends of our fingers and toes. They do provide protection to the tips ends of those fingers and toes. So they are also composed of keratin and they have a cuticle which forms a fold of skin that hides the nail root. Okay, so the term that goes in the blank on your worksheet is cuticle. The structure you see here is very similar to what we saw for the hair. There is a hair follicle, there is a nail follicle, there's also a hair root and a nail root. So they work the same way. If you damage the nail follicle, then the nail won't grow back. So if you damage only the root and the follicle is still intact, that nail can grow back. Just another look here. Um, you can see that this is stratum basal coming around here. All right, so that would be stratum basal, which forms our nail follicle. This portion here is the rubbery fingernail or toenail, and it's actually a mixture of cartilage and keratin. That's why nails are somewhat flexible. All right, so let's talk for a few minutes about the accessory glands that are found in our skin. They're called glandular epithelium. So you're looking at a sweat gland here. Sweat glands are pseudoriferous glands, and of course, as their name implies, they release sweat onto the skin surface. The whole point of sweat is to evaporate and cool our bodies, so evaporative cooling should help lower our body temperature. So the word pseudoriferous has the word odor kind of hidden in there. These particular glands may in fact make you smell if you're not, if you're not able to wash off um, the substances from your skin. So especially the ones in your armpit and groin, they contain some proteins that bacteria like to feed on. And of course, without washing, we don't wash away that, that um, bacteria and their food supply. So here you can see a sweat gland that is anchored to a hair. It's called an apocrine sweat gland. On your worksheet, there are two types of sweat glands, apocrine sweat glands and eccrine sweat glands. The apocrine ones, like this one, anchored to this hair follicle, will release onto that hair. So in your armpit, in your groin, in your head, you have these kinds of sweat glands. I'll tell you an easy way to keep this straight. Apocrine sweat glands have the word ape hidden in there. Apes are hairy, and of course, these particular sweat glands are always associated with a hair. So we don't think that apocrine sweat glands are necessarily for evaporative cooling. These, we think, have some other role. Typically, the sweat produced here has a milky color to it. You can see another set of sweat glands here. You should recognize this epithelial tissue as simple cuboidal epithelium. Here you can see another type of sweat gland called an eccrine sweat gland. This one is not associated with the hair. Instead, these are commonly found all over the body. These are the more predominant type of sweat glands that we have, and it is their job to help cool our bodies. So when we talk about sweat glands providing cooling, it's these particular ones, these eccrine sweat glands, that we're actually talking about. 
So in summary, we have two types of sweat glands. We have apocrine sweat glands that are always associated with a hair. And we have sweat glands that are not associated with hairs. And those are called eccrine sweat glands. So you'll want to take a moment and jot these two terms down under letter C on page 57. We also have another set of glands called sebaceous glands. This is just fancy language for oil glands. Sebaceous glands, of course, produce sebum or oil, and oil helps to waterproof our skin. They're always associated with a hair. Okay, so you can see this gland here, sebaceous gland, always associated with a hair. Now, the function of this gland is to help lubricate and waterproof skin and hair. Okay, the function of sebum or oil is to help lubricate or waterproof skin and hair. So, when you think about oil, you know, it makes our skin greasy. We oftentimes wash our hands, we wash our face, we wash our bodies, we wash our hair on a frequent basis. And what we're doing is washing away that protective oil covering. Unfortunately, this can make your skin dry. So we replace that, nourish, uh, that moisture by nourishing our skin with, say, lotions. We put creams and conditioners on our hair. So if your skin is too dry, that can actually allow for bacterial infections to make their way into the skin. So as much as it kind of grosses us out, having oily hair and oily skin can actually be a benefit to protecting that skin and the hair. Unfortunately, these sebaceous glands can become inflamed with, say, bacteria, for instance, and in that case, we have acne. You can see in this picture, the sebaceous gland has become inflamed. It's swollen in this picture. This picture shows also skin growing over the top of this gland. That means the inflammation and that sebum is trapped inside that gland. This is what we would call a whitehead because there is skin growing over the top of this um, gland and the sebum is trapped inside. By contrast, a blackhead is a type of um, inflamed sebaceous gland where there is an ability for the sebum to escape. So the color there, black, is actually coming from the uh, collection of melanin in our skin, no matter your skin tone. So the difference here is whether or not skin grows over the top of that inflamed gland. Whiteheads have skin growing over the top, whereas blackheads do not. Now, you may want to flip the page with me over to 59. There is a practice picture there for you. It is this one here. It's already labeled. So I encourage you to take a look at this picture and know this one for the upcoming test.